sign Q and A, and uh, we'll and you can send it direct to Q and A, and we'll be able to answer at the end after our panelists finish. And this session will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to refer to the film after, we'll be sending the link with you. Also, we are live on Facebook, so we may have some uh, audience there, and we may we also be we will also be answering your questions if you have some. Just post them on the comments. With that being said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the next slide. Um, today we have our it's today we have our regional webinar. Um, Give All me right. a second, Sorry, Jenny, because technical. it's not working. Sure. Yeah. Give me a second. Sure. Some technical issues always happen. So we're just going to go ahead and share the PowerPoint again with the presentation because we want to introduce to our speakers for you to get to know them today. So, just for you all to know, today uh, we are having an audience from the NCAC region that covers North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. So if you are from any of these countries, welcome. Um, if, you, if you are from somewhere else, you are also pretty welcome to this event. Uh, this event is organized by Education USA Mexico. Uh, I want to thank Jorge Reyes, the Education USA Advisor in Oaxaca, Ana de la Renal, the Education USA in, uh, Advisor in Hidalgo, and also our country coordinator, Elvira Castillo, who has been part of this organization. My name is Jenny Diaz, and I'm the Education USA Advisor in Merida. Uh, welcome, everyone. Before we start with our panel, that is the, about this pretty important month that we're celebrating, the Black History Month, uh, we have this important panel today. Before we go ahead and start with that, I just want to give you a, cute, a quick uh, introduction to Education USA. We are a global network of advising centers from the United States Department Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. In this region, in this region, we have around 56 and Education USA advising centers where we offer free access to introductory, introductory information on US studies. Mm -hmm. Our audience normally are students, higher education institutions, government, and NGOs. And we offer comprehensive and current information about any services that we have for higher education institutions in the US. If you wanna hear more information, if you wanna know about this, you can go ahead and visit the website that is on the slide, that is educationusa.gov, that, that is state.gov. So go ahead, if you wanna hear more or find your closest advising center, you can go ahead and find us there. So basically what I wanted to share today is that we are in February, February the month where we celebrate the Black History Month in the US. And that's why Education USA in collaboration with the US Embassy has organized this event. And is hosting a series of events promoting historically black colleges and universities, also known as HBCU. And in today's panel, we're very happy to have four representatives representatives from HBCUs that will talk about their institutions, including their history, programs, benefits, and opportunities for you and more. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, with that being said, I want to introduce our first panelist today. His name is Dr. Stevens Edmond. He is a Dean and Professor Emeritus of the School of Business and Technology at Houston Tillerson University in Austin, Texas. He created this school and became the inaugural dean. He holds his doctorate in international business and has over four decades of teaching and administrative experience at the university level. Edmond's most recent projects include creating an MBA degree program and developing the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Both, both are at Houston Tulsa University. Edmond is also the Dean of the Office of International Program. Edmond, Dr. Edmond, thank you for being here today with us. Thank you. Our, our next Next uh, panelist today is Dr. Josephine Okoronkwo Honor. The, she, she has over three decades of higher education experience. She received her terminal degree in public policy from Southern University, Baylor Rush, Louisiana. Her dissertation topic was a perceived construction of a racial minority immigration, a case study of Black Africa. 
She currently serves as the Director of Spin Development and International Center. In addition to serving as an administrator, she's also an author and teaches public policy at Southern University at New Orleans. Welcome, Dr. Josephine. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Lokesh Shivakumaraya. He's an executive director of international relations and assistant to the provost at Mississippi Valley State University. He has over 14 years of professional experience in international education and student services at different institutions. He has also served as the clinical assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at Mississippi State University. He has formerly held positions of the associate director, assistant director, and the director of international programs at different institutions, including HBCU. Thank you for being here as well. And last but not least, we have Mr. William M. Barber. He's a senior assistant director of admissions at Xavier University, New Orleans, Louisiana. Born, raised, and educated in New York, William has a bachelor's of science in psychology from Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, a master's in adult education and counseling from the University of Connecticut. With an extensive experience in the area of admission, he has worked for several universities. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to have you all. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing more from you and learning about your institutions and HBCUs. I'll give the microphone to Jorge, who is the advisor who's gonna run this interview with us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Wow, I feel so small in front of these personalities. Thank you, thank you, thank you a lot for being here. It is our pleasure to have you here. And as uh, as Jenny said, we are commemorating the Black History Month, and that's uh, we believe it's quite important for our students to get to know more about this uh, uh, tradition and this uh, 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 cultural aspect that the United States offer as well uh, for for international students. Okay, and because this is a panel, I will be doing the questions now, okay? Um, so starting with, with the first one, can you tell us about your institution? What makes it unique and different from other institutions? And this, this question goes for all the four panelists, but I will be uh, giving the, the place, uh, you know, ladies first. So please, Dr. Josephine. Thank you so much for having Southern University at New Orleans to be part of this great experience. Yes, I represent my Chancellor, Dr. Emmons. I bring you greetings from Southern University of New Orleans. We are in New Orleans, the center of the world where visitors come, and now it's magical. That's one of the reasons why you all should come to New Orleans and especially to Southern University of New Orleans. Why are we unique? We are a family. At New Orleans, at Sulu, you have a sense of family. Everybody is called by their names. If your name is Josephine, we don't know you by a number. We don't know you by your, the last four digits of your social security number or your N number. You are unique by your first name. We care, we nurture our students, we have a diverse faculty and staff, and um, we are like gumbo. We have people from all over the world and that makes us unique. And our tuition is affordable, the most affordable in the state of Louisiana. Come experience Southern University at New Orleans. is the only public HBCU in the city of New Orleans and the member campus of the only system, Southern University system in the entire universe. So thank you and come to Southern University at New Orleans sooner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. What about, uh, can, can you still uh, uh, keep answering the question, please, Dr. Steven? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Jorge. Um, we're Houston Tilson University in Austin, Texas maybe two miles uh, away from the, the big school, University of Texas. Uh, we were mm, established in 1875. That makes us about 147 years. We're a private, non-private HBCU. 
We're the oldest institution of higher learning in Austin, older than University of Texas and any other school, all the other schools. We offer over 20 undergraduate degrees and two master's programs. One of the masters is the MBA, which is very popular. The top programs in undergraduate, business, biology, computer, computer science. Uh, the, the university is accredited by one of the regionally accredited uh, affiliations and the School of Business is accredited as well with a national organization. Uh, wh why are we so unique? We're in Austin, Texas, and most of you probably know that Austin, Texas is a tech hub. We have partnerships with just about every tech company in the city or the area, I should say. Um, giving you an example, Tesla just moved over here and they came to visit HT before any other university uh, wanting to uh, partner with us. Matter of fact, we did partner with Tesla because they brought so many goodies with them. They wanted us to create a mechanical engineering program to support their, their uh, workforce. And we were happy to oblige uh, because they promised to purchase all the lab equipments that we would need because the mechanical engineering program, which will launch in fall of this year, will uh, require four labs. And the equipment, almost a half a million dollars, Tesla say that they will support it, plus give scholarships to the students in the mechanical engineering program. One more, Apple is also a great partner. They've given us almost a million dollars to support our uh, initiative of producing more male teachers. So everyone who wants to become a teacher, if you're a male, you can come to school absolutely free. So, uh, oh, something else that's unique, <clears throat> Excuse me. We are an HBCU, however, 60% of our student body is comprised of African Americans, 30% 3-0 Hispanic, Hispanics, and 10% Anglo and others. So I, I we, we consider that very unique because we're an HBCU and we're we're categorized as an HBCU as well as a Hispanic serving institution. So come and visit us. Come and enroll at HT and you will not be disappointed. Wow, great opportunities in Texas, I guess, right? <laughs> opportunities here. <laughs> Jobs galore. Okay, what about Dr. Lokesh? What can you tell us about your institution? Thank you, Mr. Hore. I'm from Mississippi Valley State University. Mississippi Valley State University is one of the youngest HBCUs in the state of Mississippi. We were established in 1950. Before I dive more into it, I want to share that I myself was an international uh, student 20 years ago, just like the students who are watching this uh, uh, presentation. One of the beauty of Mississippi and uh, it's known for is the hospital. Mississippi is known as the hospitality state. Uh, local people welcome international students and families here in Mississippi, which is one of the key things for international students and their parents to send their um, send their kids to study in Mississippi for US higher education. Um, at Mississippi Valley State University, we offer bachelor's and master's level programs. We have an enrollment of around 2,200 students. Um, and students, I mean, we have around, I mean, our students come from all 50 uh, US states and we have over 60 international students who comes from 20 plus countries. Um, we are, um, I mean, you know, one of the, as I said earlier, Mississippi is known as a hospitality state. So we take our uh, security, I mean, say uh, of our students uh, are, are, as an utmost importance, we have a secure and friendly um, university. Uh, one of the, you know, since we are a smaller school, we have a less student to faculty ratio. What this means is it gives an opportunity for our students to engage in discussions with our faculty so that they can learn more, you know, uh, learn more and question things if they do not understand. 
and we do also have state of the art uh, academic and research facilities we encourage our both our undergraduate and graduate students in undergraduate research programs graduate research programs internships and co-ops it's students who graduate our students who are studying at mississippi valley state university they engage in uh, internships in across various tech uh, uh, industries around the us you know many of our I mean, some of our students have done internships in google microsoft and apple i mean some of our alumni um, students who graduate from valley they're working in these industries as well in fact one of our international students now who is from zimbabwe will be working for microsoft um, starting in a couple of months so basically the students who graduate from us they are all working in big tech industries across the us and some of them they go on to get their graduate degrees from some of the top schools and we are proud to state that our former you know, mvsu student association president who graduated uh, this December, she is going on to uh, her graduate school in Yale University. So we welcome all of our students, both American as well as international students. We provide that nurturing and uh, environment for them to be successful, not only in their classroom, but also um, outside of it. So we welcome you all to come explore um, Mississippi Valley State University. I would like to state some of the uh, popular programs in our undergraduate program, such as engineering technology, business administration, math, uh, math and computer science, natural sciences, and environmental health. These are some of the popular uh, programs among our international students coming to Valley. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the graduate programs, uh, we have Master of Science in Environmental Health, which is one of the popular program among our international students. On top of that, we also have um, mass communications and media. I mean, if, uh, if students wants to uh, graduate in a convergent media uh, program, the, that is something they can look into. So, having said that, um, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much for uh, having us on this uh, uh, session. Thank you very much, Dr. Lokesh. And last but not least, Mr. William, what can you tell us about your university? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for all for being a part of this program. Just to do a little backstory, um, for many of you who are outside of the United States who do not know about HBCUs, uh, just a point of reference. Reason why HBCUs are such a big thing in the United States, they were formed because back in the days of, of um, unfair treatment and other things that were going on in the country for African Americans and other uh, people of color, they were not allowed to be educated, could not go to college, could not go to high school. Education was something was denied. So HBCUs were formed and created as universities across the country that allowed African-Americans and other people of color to be able to have a college education, get a degree, and be a part of the workforce and everything that is done in the United States. So that's the main reason why HBCUs came about and are celebrated. We are one of many, and every HBCU you hear tonight and even across the country speak of semi, many things that are similar amongst us. Diversity, culture, family, uh, inclusion, everybody. Just because an HBCU means we are predominantly African-American in our students does not mean that we don't have people from all cultures, all backgrounds, attending our schools, strengthening our programs, and showing us many different parts of things we did not know. We are Xavier University. We were founded in 1925. We were founded by a Catholic sisterhood um, under the direction of Sister Catherine Drexel. She came to uh, Louisiana with a mission. Her mission was to establish a school university to educate African Americans and Native Americans. And that is what the program started and that is how we grew. We are a STEM-based heavy science, but other areas as well. That's our main program and main focus. Education was our first program and has remained a program at our school. Uh, what makes us unique, aside from again, being an HBCU and sharing all the different characteristics from the schools you've heard so far, our two probably top bragging points would be the fact that uh, we are the number one school in the United States uh, for the largest number of African-American graduates who go on to complete, not attend, but complete 
Medical School. And we are also the largest number of, uh, we award the largest number of bachelor degrees in the biological, biomedical, physical, and physics sciences in the country. Some of our other top areas are physician's assistant, um, pharmacy, outstanding in pharmacy, mass communication, psychology, um, dual degree programs in engineering. And this year we have started a brand new major, which we are understand are the only ones. It is robotics and mechatronics is our new program here at Xavier University. We are a port city. A port city means everybody that comes into a port city, your cultures come together. You learn about food, fun, facts, history, uh, um, your background, all of that is a part of Xavier University. We would enjoy everyone to come and take a look at us, see how we maneuver, see how we operate, see all the different programs that we do and get a taste of the South in the Crescent City at Xavier University. Thank you very much, Mr. William. Wow, that was that was awesome. I mean, all your universe or your universities have different characteristics. And yeah, moving on to the next uh, question. Just before we we pass on to that, I would like to remind you guys that uh, if you have any questions, you can send them to uh, Q and A. And my peer Jenny, I think it's the one in charge of that. So just uh, uh, shoot her a, a, a message through the chat box here in Zoom. Or if you are watching us on Facebook, uh, you can also ask your questions in there and we can uh, move those questions into here, into the panel. So moving on, on to the next questions, what type of opportunities does your institution offer to underrepresented and non-traditional students? And I will be starting with uh, Dr. Lokesh. All right, thank you, Mr. Hore. Um, you know, we have uh, student clubs and uh, our student affairs people work with different uh, groups of um, different groups of uh, students to help them in their overall growth. Uh, some of the opportunities what we can provide for the students are, um, you know, we have the career center which helps them to identify uh, internships and co-op opportunities while they are engaged in their undergraduate programs and graduate program. In fact, uh, Mississippi Valley State University has um, um, excellent collaborations with industry and one of the marquee program what we have here at Valley is the collaboration with uh, FedEx, which is one of the, the biggest logistic company in the world. They have a marquee center here on MBSU campus. This is the only campus uh, in the um, uh, U.S. where they have a, their uh, FedEx logistics office on campus that gives an opportunity for students who are uh, studying here at Valley to get uh, industry experience. That one example. Okay, and then we are uh, here at Valley. We also provide uh, uh, various activities for international students to involve. We have a year-long cross-cultural activities that where we can bring in local uh, students and community along with our international students we believe to i mean you know there is a saying that it takes a village to raise a kid so same philosophy i mean it takes a village for us I mean, to raise our international students so now we provide those type of opportunities for their overall development uh, so that they can be comfortable and get accustomed to uh, to mississippi delta and excel and uh, here at uh, uh, office of international programs uh, we uh, help our students maintain their, um, you know, uh, immigration uh, policies and regulations, may, and uh, we'll find them more opportunities to engage with the community and uh, be successful in extracurricular activities while they're doing good on their academic uh, uh, aspect as well. And uh, to help them even with their academics, uh, our academic affairs have programs such as mentorship program and tutoring for uh, students, if they are finding anything difficult in their uh, the courses, they can as well go and take advantage of those things. We match them with their peers so they uh, so that they can learn from one another. These are some of the few. You're on mute, Mr. Hore. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> what about Mr. William? What can you tell us about the opportunities uh, your institution offers? Well, um... Moving into just about any area that you'd like to go, one of the wonderful things about uh, HBCUs is the fact 
that we want to make sure that our students, no matter who comes to our school and who chooses to study here, you get the opportunity to travel. If you know anything about travel and opportunities, travel makes you grow. For instance, if you are the type of person who wants to go into business, business management, marketing, sales, and finance are very big, Xavier. We have a program that will work with you if you decide to do your own business. Let's say you want to create a tech company or a clothing company or a shoe line or whatever. Our program is designed to work right along with the business and marketing program to allow you to develop that, teaching you podcasts, forecasts, where the market is going, where it's growing. Additionally, you will find that one thing that HBCUs do well with culture is that when you travel and you will meet people from different areas and different cultures all around the country, it is not so much the fact of what you are trying to say, show them or produce for them. It is how you greet them. It is how you meet them. It is how you bring your product to them in a way that is respectful and also appreciative of what you're trying to offer. That is what HBCUs do very well. We have mentorship programs. Again, study abroad, co-op programs, internship programs. If you choose to travel to another country to learn more about a science or something, the types of financial aid and scholarships that you receive at Xavier can also help pay for that. And you can also get paid for those internships. We have programs here to help students with disabilities, students who are first time uh, college students. They're the first one in their family to ever attend college being called first generation, as well as travel opportunities for other programs as well. So that's what we like to offer our students and let them know it doesn't make a difference who you are. If you come to Xavier, you will learn, you will travel and you will grow. Thank you very much. Dr. Josephine, what could you tell us about your institution? Okay, at Sulu, everybody is considered underrepresented, just as Mr. Bravo said. We are all underrepresented because it's HBCU, given the history we just learned from Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. So at Sulu, we provide students with student support services, be it career services. We don't let you just go. If you are in IT, we link you with all the internship availabilities. In the city of New Orleans, we have high-tech companies right here in New Orleans. And at Sulu, our high point is our IT. They are recruited from everywhere, including at Austin. I don't know one of us is at Austin yet. They come to us to recruit our students in the IT program for six figures. I can brag about that, just as Xavier can brag about their medical <laughs> students. I brag, we brag about our IT program. Mm -hmm. Our students make more than we do, more than the professors. They are high tech, they know it all. So our students currently, we have over 20 Indian students in our master's program, and all of them are connected through our career services program to IT companies right here in New Orleans. One or two of our international students are in the social work. That's our great program too. We have social work as the number one program that Southern University is known for. And then, the opportunities we provide specifically for our international students is number one. We care for them, be it English as a second language. Yes, we do not have it as a program, but we have our English department. They offer their services to support students who need English as a second language. They help them. Our writing center helps every student whether you're from here or you're from there. Our writing center is unique with professors with PhDs in, in English language and our non-traditional students too. We help them do work study on campus. We help them with note-taking because some of them, they have left college for a long time. So we teach them skills that help them in the classroom and outside the classroom. We provide international events where everybody gets a test of India, a test of Cameroon, a test of 
Mexico, yes, we have Mexican students, Spanish students. We have them too. So everybody, we all come together. In September, we celebrate Hispanic Cultural Month. We do that every year at SUNY. So we provide opportunities so they don't feel alone. They feel like they belong to Southern University at New Orleans. We make them feel welcome. So where we have opportunities, cultural, whether in the classroom, like I said earlier, we have a diverse faculty and staff, which makes us unique. And we provide the opportunities our students need to succeed inside the classroom and outside the classroom through our academic support services and our student support services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. And what about Dr. Steven? What can you tell us about your, your, your university? Sure, sure. We, we, of course, uh, we're blessed by being in Austin, Texas. Many opportunities, but let's go <laughs> with it. <laughs> uh, we have several, several competitive scholarships for students upon enrollment. We have very few for those who apply from abroad, but once they apply, once they uh, enroll at the university, then there are so many scholarships uh, backed by some of the tech companies in the city. We have uh, on-campus jobs for new students. A lot of times students do not believe that they can work immediately upon uh, enrolling at a university. Sure you can, as long as it is on campus and we have several jobs on campus. As a matter of fact, in my in the computer lab, I personally hire seven students every year, first time freshman now, uh, seven every year to work in the computer lab and we pay them about 600, $500 to $600 a month. Now, after the students have earned at least 30 credit hours, they can work off campus at what we call a CPT. They can do an internship off campus and that's when they begin making money because those tech firms will pay you $20 to $40 uh, per hour uh, for, for our students. We have plenty of travel uh, to conferences for, for students. We encourage the students to tag along with their professors when the professors go on professional development conferences. Students go there. They, they, they also uh, go to many uh, uh, major specific conferences. We want them to go and learn, develop skills, develop professional, uh, uh, professional skills. So, and we pay for all this. There's a lot of net, again, we're in Austin, Texas, a lot of networking opportunities with major companies such as Tesla, IBM, Dell, Samsung, Amazon, all of those companies there. And we have several study abroad. We want students to learn other cultures. So we take them abroad. We have study abroad, well, prior to COVID-19, we had study abroad programs in China, in Argentina and uh, Dominican Republic. We had service learning programs in Belize and Costa Rica. And uh, we, we plan on adding some more as soon as we can travel again. We encourage all students, not just US students, but international students as well, to, to, to take advantage of these study abroad because we try to pay uh, most of the costs for study abroad because we know students have, they are challenged with, with having a, a budget to travel. Now, upon graduation, again, I keep saying we're in Austin, Texas, great paying jobs. As uh, Dr. Josephine said, our, our tech students, computer science students, they major in software engineer. The minimum salary, if you have a 3.0 with a first degree, is $115,000. She didn't want to mention a dollar amount, but I, I, I'm business. I like to talk about <laughs> so, 115,000. The highest uh, salary that one of our students received in computer science just recently was 165,000. This is just a 22 year old kid now. Uh, Amazon wanted him so badly. He was, uh, and, and Microsoft wanted him as well. 
Amazon came up with the right dollar amount, $165,000. And our business students, they generally do a minimum of uh, $65,000 upon graduating. The, the marketing students do a little better with about $75,000. Now, those, are, those students who want to go to grad school instead of working uh, uh, immediately after graduation, we have partnerships with several graduate schools, where, which will give our students scholarships. We just had a young lady from Togo who finished at Brandeis. Brandeis gave her a, a, a two-year scholarship for her master's in accountancy. We have a young lady who went to Rice University for industrial engineering master's, 50% uh, free. Bentley out of Boston generally gives us a 100% scholarship and UT. UT has been coming around for our program in accountancy. They generally give us a, give our students 85% scholarship. So many, many opportunities at Houston Tills University. Again, I, I know I keep saying this, it's, it's a blessing to be in Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. Moving on to the next question, we only, uh, we will have only two uh, 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 panelists answering this question and then for the upcoming one, again, other two. And for this one, what is the profile of the students that you are looking for and what about diversity at HBCUs? And I will start with you, Dr. Steven. Okay, thank you, thank you. The profile, we're, we're always looking for high GPA. For international students, the GPA that, I, that we accept and I, I, I generally uh, review all the international uh, applications. I, I, I like to see a 3.0 GPA uh, because uh, we have such quality programs and it demands a lot of the students. So I, I, I need to see a 3.0 GPA. I need to see uh, from reading the uh, essays that the students are, are to write and from the resume, I need to have a sense that the student ha uh, can have uh, that the students have leadership qualities, and most importantly, the students must be comfortable with a diverse student body and faculty. So those are the qualities that I look for the, the, in students. Now the admission requirements they're general, just like all the other HBCUs. They must have graduated from a secondary school, which is comparable to a United States high school. Again, the equivalent of a US 3.0 GPA, combined score of 1,000 on the SAT, and a TOEFL score. I, I, we need to see a 61 internet based and uh, else a 5.5. So that, that's, that's, that's our requirements and that's the profile of the students that we are looking for, international students that we are looking for at HT. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. What about uh, Dr. Lokesh? What can you add? Or if, if your university is something different than this, what can you tell us about? Okay. <clears throat> we, we are uh, looking for, um, I mean, when we talk about international students, we want to recruit students from our, uh, around the world to get the diverse uh, student population here at Valley. Um, I mean, you know, if students are interested to uh, study in the university town who can take advantage of our fee structure where we do not have the out of state fee, you know, uh, so um, for an undergraduate program, undergraduate program on an average, it is 15,500 per year. That includes tuition, uh, room and board. On top of this, we also, there are also some scholarship opportunities and on campus job opportunities for them. If, uh, and if the students are um, uh, looking for programs like engineering technology, business administration, natural sciences, mathematics, computer science, and information sciences. Uh, these are the type of students we are looking at. And regarding the uh, academic profile of the students, we're looking for someone um, who can come here and be successful. So we are looking for students with at least a 3.0 GPA um, and uh, who will be comfortable uh, to be in a uh, university, university town kind of setting. And, uh, and explore all the opportunities, what we have and uh, um, give back to the uh, university com uh, community. You can see that all these different programs, what you can see around on my background are different opportunities that we provide, um, just like Travel Tuesdays, Cafe Cultural, all those things where they can come and engage 
And here's the thing. I mean, when you are in a university town, it is what you make out of it, okay? Once you come here, what is it that you can make out of it? You can be in the four walls of your uh, dorm room and your classroom and graduate, but you can also be out there and take advantage of all these opportunities so that it will help in the overall development of uh, students. So we are looking for students uh, will be active, um, who can actively participate in this and take it care, take advantage of uh, the academic offerings and the extracurricular offerings what we uh, have here at Valley. Thank you very much, Dr. Lokesh. And for the next question, I will I, I would like to start with Dr. Josephine. And what are the benefits of enrolling in, a, in an HBCU? Oh, the benefits are immeasurable, uh, like, um, Mr. Williams said before in his introduction of HBCU, I used to be a, a student at um, UC Austin, so I know about Austin. Then I transferred for disclosure purposes, now I transferred to Xavier. This was in the 80s. But there were misconceptions about HBCUs then, and I believe there are still misconceptions about HBCU. I was told, oh, don't go to HBCU, don't go to Xavier. They just hand you grades. I'm like, I'm going. I was doing well at UT Austin. Then I, I believed the misconception. When I came to Xavier, I'm like, okay, they're gonna give me A, 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 A. Oh, to my greatest surprise, my first test was history. A reverend sister was teaching the history class. The first test I made an F, I'm like, oh, oh. So they're not handing grades at HBCU. So that's one misconception I really always want to clear to the world about HBCUs. They are competitive like Harvard, Yale, any other university. Yes, I graduated Magna Cum Laude from Xavier. Yes, Mr. Williams, but I'm telling you, that HBCUs, there are so many benefits. It opened my eyes to the world. I began to learn the history of African-Americans. Whereas in PWI, nobody cared about the history of African-Americans. So I learned, it was in an HBCU, I found out that the most important founding president of two African nations graduated from HBCU. And this uh, Namdi Aziki was the founding president of Nigeria and Kwame Nkrumah. So these are the things you learn from HBCU. You go, wow, and I'm originally from Nigeria, I never knew this. But it was in that history class that I found out that two presidents of African countries graduated from HBCUs in the early 1940s. So that's one benefit. You know about yourself, you become self-aware. You become more caring to other people. You don't look down on people. You also learn that you have to work hard. Nobody hands you grades. These are the benefits. And you are in a network because the alumni they help you find jobs. They make it their personal drive to get you connected, whether you're from here or from there, whether you're from Mexico, Nigeria, or Ghana. That is one thing, uh, one of the benefits of HBC, the networking. And if you like sources and all that, that is even better. They take it, you say sisterhood, and the brotherhood in HBCU. They take you up and make you dear. I mean, I can go on and on, uh, but I wanna keep it short and sweet that nothing beats HBCU. They teach you the way of life. They teach you how to survive. They teach you how to excel. If you want to be a medical doctor, I guarantee you, if you anything, you want to be a medical doctor? Find at HBCU. You find the biology professors, the chemistry professors holding you by their hands and making sure you get your MCAT score. They don't, they want you to graduate. 
go to the best medical school, go to the best law school. That's what we do at HBCUs. And I can give you testimonials of all the students who have experienced the personal touch of professors at HBC. That's why you have so many of them graduating from going from Xavier, for instance, to medical schools. I know many of them or graduating from pharmacy programs or getting their PhDs is because of the personal touch of faculty and staff. We do care at HBCUs. I can tell you that I've been at HBCU for 35 years. I was once at PWI working for them here in New Orleans. I'm not gonna call it, it's nothing like HBC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. That was amazing. Mr. William, would you like something? <laughs> would, would you like to add something to that? <laughs> You're oh, good. Okay. The reason why I sat up so high <laughs> when Dr. Josephine talked about Kwame Nkrumah and Namdi Azikawe for two reasons. I will not mention the school, but it is an HBCU and they graduated well, let's put it this way. I graduated from their HBCU in Pennsylvania, and they are both my fraternity brothers. So just something I wanted to throw out. Uh, HBCUs, one thing you should definitely know is HBCU spells one thing, family. And if you know anything about international and cultural, international uh, students and culture, family comes first. And with family, you grow, you explore, you go exponentially, you become um, the next uh, thing in your family, the next exploit, the next um, big person, the next president, the next leader, the next uh, innovator. And that is one thing that HBCUs do very well as Dr. Josephine indicated. We look for students, um, HBCUs look for the holistic, which means that we don't just look at the 3.0 or we don't just look at a high SAT score, we look at everything. What have you been involved in? What is your family background? What were some of the trials and tribulations that you went through? What did you belong to? What did you, community service did you do? What type of volunteer work did you do? All of these are the different things that make up an HBCU and bring our students here. We want people who want to challenge themselves, who want to go forward in life, want to try things they've never done before, to stand out to make their name and their legacy strong. Those are the things that are enrolling in the HBCU is very strong. It doesn't take away anything from PWIs, which is called predominantly white institutions, but family comes first. And because of family, you will not only be held up and help this family, you'll also be disciplined as family too. And you have to understand everything is not gonna be roses. At HBCUs, most of your classes are uh, small, your student teacher ratio can be anywhere from uh, 12 to 14 to maybe 18 students in class per student, per, uh, per teacher. And you may say, well, that is a benefit, but then again, I can explore. Well, here's something that you may not know. The teachers get to know you very personally. And if you decide to miss their class for whatever reason, and you go to the cafeteria, and you're sitting in there with your friends laughing and joking and man, you missed the psychology class this morning. When that professor comes in there and sees you, they will walk right over to your table and says, Jamal, you are not in my class this morning. I expect to see you there tomorrow. And everybody's looking at you like, ooh, you did a bad thing. So remember, eyes are always on you and folks are watching you wherever you go and what you do. So yes, it's family, it's support, it's love, it's strength, and throwing you out there to make sure you become the best that you can be. That is the type of benefit you get from enrolling at an HBCU. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> William. If I can resume HBCUs in one word, will be family, I guess, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Moving on to the next question. We are running out of time. So we would like to keep um, uh, maybe okay. the answers a little bit short. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you talk about the experiences that students have access into your institution, maybe about clubs, sports, uh, Greek life, extracurricular activities, something like that. And I would like to start with uh, Dr. Lokesh, please. Thank you, Mr. Hore. 
Well, we do have intramural sports where uh, international students can uh, participate. I mean, when we talk about sports, there are uh, official athletic sports as well as uh, club sports, club sports, which are intramural sports. So like we have lots of international students who come in uh, from countries who play soccer. I mean, you know, soccer is a big deal. Well, you know, football in many other countries is a big deal. Uh, so we do have um, uh, our students who play soccer with the intramural sports and um, our international students are also welcome to go engage in Greek life activities. We had a Greek um, uh, stroll off uh, this weekend and we encourage our international students to take part in that because many of them would not be aware of these fraternities and sororities in their home countries. So we welcome them to take part in this. Regarding the extracurricular activities, we have a wide variety of extracurricular activities happening on campus, including we from the Office of International Programs, we uh, implement many of the programs like, um, you know, I'm boasting that on the screen here, there's something called Cafe Cultural. We engage our international students to come and talk about their um, countries, their culture and cuisine and uh, spread this word among our uh, local students as well. You know, you want you said you keep it short. I'll end it at that, and then we'll hear it from our colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. Lokesh. Uh, okay. Dr. Josephine, what could you tell us about the access for international and local students um, at your institution? Uh, the access is great in my university. When you're talking about sports, our track and field, where we used to have track and field in my university, it just ended prior to COVID. Our track and field was 98% Jamaican students. They ran our track and field, so it's open. Whether it's soccer, it's open. Greek life is open. Extracurricular activities, we provide a test of global dishes every semester where people come in and test our dishes from India, from Jamaica, from everywhere. In fact, also SGA, we encourage our international students to contest, to become the president of the Student Government Association. We have had success. One of them from Jamaica became the first female uh, vice president of our Student Government Association. So yeah, we encourage them to get involved. Don't, be, don't shy away. That's how you test your leadership skills. If you want to go home and become the president or the senator for your country, Try it out here on our campus, contesting the election. Be Miss Suno or Miss Junior or Miss Sophomore or Miss Freshman. So we encourage them and they do participate. Oh, they want to run the homecoming. If you let them, the international, the ones we have here, they love our Student Government Association since at least one of them tried and succeeded to become the vice president. So we encourage them and they get engaged, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. Uh, Dr. Steven, what could you tell us about this? Yes, well, we, uh, let me just start off with clubs. We have several clubs, uh, actually a club for about, just about every major. We have a uh, women in tech club and uh, I went to the meeting last week and I was pleasantly surprised to see that uh, the entire members were students that I recruited from abroad. They were all international students. We have the computer science club. We have, uh, again, about 60% of the students in the computer science club are international. We have the uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, club as well. The same thing made up of mostly international. So we have a all the different clubs, accounting, science, psychology. Sports, we do not have football because we're in Austin, Texas. And when you're in Austin, Texas, football means University of Texas. So no university, no other university will have a football team in Austin, Texas, only University of Texas. So, but we do have uh, the regular base, uh, baseball, basketball. As a matter of fact, the baseball team is comprised of about 70% uh, Hispanic students. When I say Hispanic, I mean from Spain. We have some from Spain, some from Mexico, and then regular uh, Hispanic Americans. And the same goes for football. The men's and the women's team, 
made up of about 75% Hispanic as well. Track and field is good. And volleyball, the majority of the volleyball team, uh, female, made up of uh, international students. We have Greek life. We even have uh, a Hispanic uh, organization. We also have multicultural Greek uh, organization. We have many activities. We have an annual culture fest whereby students can uh, show their culture, uh, demonstrate their foods, demonstrate their dances, etc. We have uh, student government. Uh, as Dr. Josephine mentioned, in the past, we have had several international students heading the Student Government Association, becoming president. One young man from Nigeria, one young lady from uh, Trinidad, another from Jamaica. So equal rights for all the students. And then we have, we, we do celebrate Hispanic heritage as well as black history. And we have intramural sports. So plenty of extracurricular activities to make sure that the students keep busy. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. Mr. William, what can you tell us about your institution? You're muted. <laughs> Kudos to all of my uh, HBCU representatives here because they speak the truth about HBCUs. One of the big things that our listeners should understand is that clubs, organization, Greek life, all of the different things that were part of uh, PWI institutions where students were not allowed to join or become a part of, that is the, one of the things that are celebrated at HBCUs. Same organization, same clubs and everything where we have stars that shine, move forward, become international stars. We have close to 200 clubs and organizations, several different fraternities and sororities. We have the Divine Nine, as they call it, which is the largest number that you can have of, eight, of um, historically black fraternities and sororities, 50 different majors. Um, we have students that have graduated from Xavier who've gone on to work and represent Fortune 500 companies, those that have started their own magazines and programs. We want students to come to Xavier who really feel that they know there is a place for them, an opportunity to grow, a place to express themselves and make sure, make sure that they become a well-rounded student in just about every area possible. Find mentorships, find people who will lead you, find people who will guide you. That's what's important in life, a mentor, a leader and a guide. Thank you very much. Before moving on to the next question, um, you all have been sharing experiences about some uh, alumni that have been studying at, at HBCUs. And the next question goes to this. Uh, if any one of you would like to share, I, I know uh, Dr. Lokesh have been sending some messages regarding this, uh, but yeah, but just take one or two minutes to just share about an, a, 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 an outstanding alumni that you know that have uh, graduated from an HBCU, if you are so kind, please. I mean, you can you can take turns. I will, I'll go because I already posted something. Yeah, <laughs> you sure. Know, uh, uh, Jer Jerry Rice uh, graduated from Mississippi Valley State University. If you know Jerry Rice, he played for San Francisco 49ers. Uh, he's the best wide receiver to ever play NFL and know that he graduated from Mississippi Valley State University. HBCUs not only graduate leaders, uh, world leaders, but they also graduate great sports persons, both male and female. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lokesh. Anyone else? Well, if I may. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will talk about uh, our famous graduate from Houston Tills University, AZ uh, Martin. Uh, most people do not remember her because this was way back during the Jimmy Carter era. She was the first female, black female, uh, U.S. treasurer, came from my university, and she, she is still on, the one, on some of the one dollar bills. If, uh, I'd love to send each one of you a, a dollar to see who you're talking about, but A.Z. Martin was the first black U.S. treasurer under Jimmy Carter's administration. Finishing political science at Houston Phillips University. B. Wow, that's awesome. Anyone else that would like to share? I know Mr. Yu Yang, uh, he posted something here. Um, 
Yeah, has a student from Nigeria who is currently the vice president of our student government association. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, to manage events, initiatives, and policies for all students, he is slated to become the next president of the SGA. So that's awesome. Congratulations, uh, yeah, Mr. Yu Yang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have an outstanding alum who graduated from Southern University at New Orleans many, many years ago and became the first African American dean of Loyola's law school here in New Orleans. Graduated from Southern University, he's deceased, but he became the first African American dean of the law school at Loyola, New Orleans. So we have many of them. Many of them are senators down in the state house here in New Orleans, in Baton Rouge. We have MDs who went from our biology program because sometimes we only talk about the stars but we forget that there are other stars in other areas. Like we have our IT experts, we have our medical doctors who did not go through like Xavier, but they went through my university, Southern University of New Orleans and went straight to LSU New Orleans and are now practicing physicians right here in the city of New Orleans. So yes, we do have them. Dr. Michael, and I can tell you he's my son. He went to school and went to um, LSU New Orleans and now he's a practicing emergency room physician. Yes, we have stars. They might not be out there in the news, but we have produced stars in our own rights. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. And moving on onto the, I think is the last question. So finally, in a few words, uh, what can you, what, what are the highlights and the best features of your institution? Just to wrap up this uh, amazing experience that we all, that, that myself, I consider it was a great experience. And I guess all the attendees will agree with me. So why cannot uh, start with uh, Mr. William, please? Um, comes to mind, what quickly comes to mind, uh, our best highlights and features, the students that we attract, that we admit, that we graduate, and that go on to make uh, their life and their step in the world. That's the biggest highlight and feature of our school that I can say. Uh, our Southern location, being a port city where again, we had an influx of different cultures and ideas and thoughts. Um, everything that you can possibly imagine that comes across to Xavier's campus just enriches our people. And also our access to uh, health technologies, which is one of our strongest areas here at the school. I wanted to just quickly add from the last question um, that um, one of our alums is our, also our former president uh, at our school, Dr. Norman C. Francis. And his, to his credit, he is the longest serving sitting president of any university or college in the United States. So he served for 47 years. So I just wanted to add that as one of our great alums. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. William. And yeah, Mr. Yu Yang also shared another one in here, Alexis Herman. I don't know, Mr. Yu Yang, if you wanna open up your mic and then just, just talk about this one. Instead oh, of yes, me uh, taking well, over. Yes, uh, <laughs> I guess uh, this one is, uh, we're well, talking about my, my, yeah, my colleague, uh, Mr. Barber has uh, been very eloquent in uh, speaking about, I guess, uh, of, uh, of our many notable alumni. So Alexis Herman, who graduated from Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans in uh, 69, class of 69. So is the first African-American U.S. Secretary of Labor and also former director of White House Office of Public Liaison. And our, our, also our recent uh, alum, so um, Dr. Regina Benjamin um, graduated in 70, 79, class of 79. So she was uh, the US uh, Surgeon General by, uh, from 2019, 2009 to 2013 under President Obama. Uh, she's now on our faculty, actually a, a pharmacy, ph school of pharmacy, uh, college of pharmacy faculty member. Wow, thank you very much. Great personalities. And as you can see guys, well, a lot of uh, experience at HBCUs again. 
Um, so continuing with this question, I would like to, uh, this, uh, Dr. Josephine, if you could um, add to these questions, uh, the highlights and best features mm -hmm. of your institution. The best feature in, at Southern University at New Orleans is students first. We believe students are number one. We don't do anything without our students. So students are number one priority. We take them from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And our greatest highlight is that we graduate many students in social work, in IT, in all the sciences, biology, physics, chemistry. We graduate African-Americans, international students, in all these areas, and we're a diverse institution, the only historical black institution, public institution in the city of New Orleans, and the only Southern University system in the whole entire world. That makes a huge difference. We are five campuses, we are a system. So that's a highlight of SUNO. SUNO is just a campus of a system scattered all over Louisiana. So that's our best feature, students first and the campus of a system mm -hmm. where we graduate students of high quality mm -hmm. who go out to serve the city, the state, the nation and the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Josephine. Dr. Steven. Yes, sir. Um... One of the best features of Houston Tillerson University is being located in Austin, Texas. Uh, the city of Austin, Texas, was raided was rated, uh, was rated before rated before COVID nineteen as the one of the best places to live in. Also, one of the best places to work because of all the partnerships we have with the tech companies here. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned before, any tech company that you can probably think about, it's here in Austin, Texas, which, which bodes well for the students because they have jobs. And uh, we, we talked about the diverse community. Not only is the university very diverse, but also the city itself is very diverse. It's an international city, very diverse. You find cultures from around the world. Uh, which plays right uh, into our students. I mean, they enjoy it. This is a, a, a recruitment tool that I use when I go on the road, let them know how, how diverse the city itself is. So uh, lo the location, yes. The uh, diversity, yes. And our highly ranked programs, especially business, computer science, and uh, uh, biology. Those are the best features of, of our university. And of course, students, yes, but I'm talking about in particular those. Thank you very much. And I think this is the last question that we have on our presentation, but we have a very interesting question on the chat. Uh, I don't know, Jenny, if you would like to read it. Sure, George, thank you. In the meaning of time, since we're running a little bit behind, I just chose this one randomly, and it's like to close with, what do you enjoy most about working for an HBCU? Um, whoever wants to go first. I, I, I could not hear that properly. Can you please repeat? What is, the question was, what do, you, what do you enjoy most about working for an HBCU? Mm. Oh, uh, I, 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 boy, I've been working at HBCU since uh, my days at Dillon University way back in the 1980s. And I just simply love uh, uh, working with the students. I have a passion for the students. They, they come to our schools with some deficiencies from high school. Mm -hmm. And by the time they graduate, there are diamonds, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And that's what I enjoy, grooming <laughs> the students, helping them, helping to shape their future. This is, this is, this is rewarding. And uh, I tried a PWI once before. I was not getting the same satisfaction. So I returned to the HBCUs and uh, I, I, will, I will retire 
maybe for a third time at an HBCU. So it's, it's working with the students. I have a passion for the students, uh, for the students who come to us with some deficiencies, some learning deficiencies, but once our professors work, start working with them, they are refined and ready to go out in the workplace. Thank you very um, much, Dr. Steven. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, 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 jump on the same band, bandwagon as Dr. Edmund, the exact same bandwagon, uh, working at HBCUs, working closely with the students. My first job ever at an HBCU, but prior to that, I was uh, teaching in high school, was working in the financial aid department when financial aid, uh, believe it or not, was a lot more cumbersome back then than it is now. And being able to be a mentor and a, a big brother or big sister to this, uh, I'm sorry, a big brother or cousin or uncle, whatever you want to call it, to all the different students, that little bit of help right there shapes them into understanding more about themselves and, and how they can be a better person. And that is what kept me motivated to working in, in education and staying involved in it. So again, yes, as Dr. Edmund said, working with the students, uh, understanding and meeting their families and everything, and just trying to be that spark sometimes when they need to talk, ask questions, when they need a good pat on the back, when they need to be led, when they need to be applauded for all of their accomplishments. That is my greatest joy. I'm gonna concord too with uh, Dr. Edmond and Mr. Babatou, all these things. For my department, the international department, it's all about shaping lives. Mm -hmm. That's my mantra, shaping lives, developing minds. We make sure we shape our students. They come to us with baggages and we help them unpack and help them shape their lives, whether they're international or domestic. They come with baggages, at least for my university. It's a unique population. And we help them create wellness. So if you go on my page, you see shaping lives, developing minds, and creating wellness. We help them get well, too, from whatever baggage you bring. You come to Sulu. We help create wellness, help you develop your mind and help you shape your lives. And at the end, four years, five years, six years, we encourage them to graduate within four years. <laughs> Don't go past four. The government tells you, oh, you can do it in six years. Josephine Okoronko tells them, do it in four years and move on. And when they do that, they come back and say, wow, that is so great. And you get satisfied just from seeing the accomplishment of somebody who came to you four years ago, knowing nothing, and now has a six-figure salary better than I do. And I say, good for you. I applaud you. Yes. So yes, that is my satisfaction. And that's why I stayed at HBC. So all right, I would like to add something. That, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go right, right ahead. Now, <clears throat> as I said earlier, I started here in Mississippi as an international student 20 years ago. You know, Mississippi is in my blood, okay? It's my, it's my passion. I wanted to give back to Mississippi. What better opportunity than serving in academia in Mississippi gives you that opportunity and mold our students to be a future leaders who can drive Mississippi and US and the world ahead. So that's the satisfaction what you get. And you mentor these uh, young minds to be a successful leaders or successful sportsmen going forward. Um, that's all uh, you, you need. That, that's, uh, that's the motivation for me to work in the academia and in HBCU. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Josephine, Dr. Steven, Dr. Lokesh, Mr. William. Did what, this was a great experience to hear you. And we, I, 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 I guess the attendees will agree with me that you guys are in love with the job you do. And thank you very much for that because we need tutors and we need uh, people that we can rely on and pushes, uh, 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 pushes to be better. And thank you for being that kind of people. Thanks a lot. So because of the time, we actually are over time. 
and we apologize with you guys uh, to, 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 to be over this. Uh, but yeah, remember that tomorrow we will have our cho our showcase with these universities as well. Um, that will be at 3 p.m. Mexico City time, which will be, uh, I think, 4 p.m. for DC, New York area, uh, just for your reference. And um, yeah, just uh, that showcase will be on, on Facebook. So just uh, <coughs> keep in tune with the account on Facebook with Education USA Mexico. And yeah, this uh, this is uh, these are our channels of communication: email, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the blog that we have. And once again, thank you very much, Dr. Josephine, Dr. Stephen, Dr. Lokish, and Mr. William. It was a great pleasure and an honor to have you here with us at, uh, with Education USA and uh, through this panel. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very you. much. Our thank pleasure. You. Our pleasure. Nice to meet with you all. Have a good one. Okay. You too. Good night, everybody. We're going to snow this one. Go find more. Thank you. See you, Mr. Dr. Lokesh. Okay. See you, sir. Dr. I remember right. seeing you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow, remember. Yes.